30 years ago right here on this campus. God changed my life in a way that raises the hope that tonight some amazing things are going to happen. Raise your hand if you're 20 years old. Okay. I was 20 years old in uh, the summer of 1966, and I had come here from Greenville, South Carolina, Southern Baptist boy, and, and uh, I had grown up in White Oak Baptist Church, and something happened. I don't know what it was, psychologically, physically, relationally. Along about the sixth grade, I began to be so nervous that I couldn't begin to speak in front of a group. My throat would close up, my hands would shake, my knees would shake, my heart would beat so fast that I could look down and see my shirt. I would be coming down, be coming down the row when you're supposed to read the paragraph in the eighth grade, and I would get up and go to the bathroom and cry. I had to give public uh, book reports in civics, and I didn't do it. I took C's instead of that, and I came to Wheaton College, and I saw in the catalog that you had to take a speech class, <laughs> and I hyperventilated, and, uh, and I said, I'll put that off to the very end, and then, and then maybe I'll drop out of college. <laughs> and in the summer of 1966, as I was wondering how in the world I would make it through classes, because some classes you had to do public things in, Evan Welch, who was the chaplain in those days, came up to me during summer school as I was taking chemistry trying to catch up with a pre-med course, which God mercifully delivered me from with mononucleosis. <laughs> Got me on the track. He said, you want to pray in chapel this summer? <sighs> oh my goodness. And I found myself saying, this is, this is a divine moment. I found myself saying, how long do you have to pray? <laughs> he said, 30 seconds. And out of my mouth came the most unbelievable, okay. <laughs> now, you, you, you just can't imagine what this was like. Maybe one or two or a half a dozen in this room know what I went through in high school. I swore I'd never, if God gave me the opportunity, relive my high school years. And I wouldn't. I'd ever go back again. It was awful. <laughs> and I went out on front campus, and I walked back and forth in that June hot sun, and I said, I've never done it since in exactly the same way, and I'm going to ask for some of this tonight, not publicly necessarily, but in your heart. I said, Lord, if you'll get me through 30 seconds in front of 500 people. It looked like this crowd here. I will never turn down a speaking engagement out of fear again. And you just can't imagine what that cost me to say that. That was a vow. I, I vowed and I read the Psalms and I vowed that I would never do that. And I memorized that prayer call. I worked on that thing, and you know the size of the pulpit over there in Edmund Chapel. I took hold of that thing, and I made it. And I don't think I've broken my vow. Something broke. Something changed. And God wants to change something in you tonight. I am sure that you're here because there are some trajectories of your life He wants to just do a 90 degree on. There's some bondage, like a physical, emotional thing that's got you losing in life that he wants to be done with. So let me just pray as we get into this. Father, even here I taste some of that old nervousness. This is such a hungry crowd and I feel so inadequate to do justice to this amazing theme of doing missions when dying is gain. So would you come on me, and would you come on these precious people, God, the potential in this room for the nations is so great. So I ask you with all my heart, and I know that hundreds join with me in this request, that this would be an immeasurable moment in the life of world evangelization and the completion of the Great Commission. 
and Wheaton College and the history that will be written in 50 years about the end of the millennium at this school. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm on a mission now from my church. They let me do these things because uh, we have a mission statement at our church and it goes like this. It's the mission statement of my life. That's one of the great things about hanging around a church for 17 years. Your mission statement and the church mission statement tend to meld. And my mission statement in life and the church's mission statement is we exist to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things for the joy of all peoples. We exist to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things for the joy of all peoples. And I love that mission statement for a lot of reasons. One is because I know it cannot fail and I know it cannot fail because it's a promise. Matthew 24, 14. This gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. And I hope that you know or are coming to these meetings so that you might learn that nations doesn't mean political states. It means something like people groups, ethnic linguistic groupings, and that we may be absolutely certain every one of them will be penetrated to the degree that you can say a witness, an understandable self-propagating witness is there, will happen. And let me give you some reasons why we can bank on that. My outline tonight, if you like outlines from preachers ahead of time, the uh, promise is sure, the price is suffering, and the prize is satisfying. That's my outline. Now let's start with the promise is sure for several reasons. Number one, Jesus never lies. Heaven and earth may pass away, but my word will never pass away. And it was Jesus who said, Matthew 24, 14, not me. And so this mission that we're on together is going to finish. It's going to be done. And you can either get on board and enjoy the triumph, or you can cop out and waste your life. You have those two choices because there's not a middle choice like, well, maybe it won't happen, and then I can be on the best side by not jumping on board. That won't happen. The second reason I know it's going to happen is because the ransom has already been paid for those people among all the nations. According to Revelation 5, 9, worthy art thou to open the scroll, cut its seals, for thou wast slain and by thy blood didst ransom men for God from every tribe and people and tongue and nation and hast made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on earth. They're paid for. God's not going to go back on his son's payment. You remember that amazing story of the Moravians. I love the stories of the Moravians. And in northern Germany, two of them getting on a boat ready to sell themselves into slavery, as it were, in the West Indies, never to come back again. And as the boat drifts out into the harbor, they lift their hands and say, may the Lamb receive the reward of His suffering. And what they meant was, He already bought those people. And we're going to go find them by indiscriminately preaching the gospel as the Holy Spirit calls them to Himself. So I know this can't abort because the debt has been paid for God's people everywhere in the world. Those lost sheep, as Jesus called them, that are scattered throughout the world that will come in as the Father calls through the preaching of the gospel. Here's the third reason I know it's going to happen, which makes me glad that I've got this mission statement for my church. The glory of God is at stake. I've just oodles of text written here in my notes. Let me just pick one. Rebel, um, Romans 15, 8, and 9. Christ became a servant to the circumcised in order to confirm the truthfulness of God so that he might make strong or sure or reliable the promises made to the patriarchs and in order that the nations might glorify God for his mercy. 
So the whole purpose of the incarnation was to bring glory to the Father through the manifestation of mercy to the nations. The glory of God is at stake in the Great Commission. And back in 1983 at Bethlehem Baptist Church, John Piper and Tom Steller, my sidekick of 17 years, both were met by God in amazing ways. Tom, in the middle of the night, couldn't sleep. He got up, he put on a John Michael Talbot song, lay down on the couch, and he heard our theology translated into missions because we are a God-glory-oriented people, but we had not made sense of missions like we ought. And John Michael Talbot was singing about the glory of God filling the earth the way the waters cover the sea. And Tom wept for an hour. And at the same time, God was moving on me and Noel to say, what can we do to make this place a launching pad for missions? And everything came together to make an electric moment in the life of our church. And it all flowed from a passion for the glory of God. And I think as I listen to the worship here and I, as I watch what happens among you, I think you've got it. And so I hope translations are being made from vertical to horizontal in your love for the glory of God. And my last reason for believing this promise is sure and is going to happen is that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. A few weeks ago, I'm preaching through Hebrews, and we got to Hebrews chapter 6, which is, you know, a very difficult text about whether or not these people are Christians or not because they fall away. And in verse 3 of chapter 6, I'm going to turn around and talk to this crowd for a minute. In verse... Oh, that won't work. In... Oh, forget it. You can understand me, okay? Thank you. I'm not, I've not forgotten you're there. Shoot. In verse 3 of chapter 6, you have this amazing statement. Now, this is just one little teeny weeny evidence of the massive biblical evidence for why I'm a Calvinist. A seven point Calvinist. And the verse says, Let us press on to maturity leaving behind the former things, and this we will do if God permits. And there fell across my congregation the most unbelievable silence because they heard the implications of that. You mean God might not permit a body of believers to press on to maturity? God is sovereign. He's sovereign in the church. He's sovereign among the nations. And just one testimony to what I mean by that. I hope many of you read the article in CT, Christianity Today, a couple or three weeks ago. The retelling of the story of Jim Elliott and Nate Saint and Pete Fleming and Roger Udarian and Ed McCulley. <laughs> I'll remember that one, McCulley. Nate Saint retold the story of his dad's spearing, gutting with Alka spears in Ecuador. And he tells the story having learned of new details of intrigue in the Alka tribe that were responsible for this killing when it shouldn't have and seemingly wouldn't have and couldn't have happened and yet did happen and having discovered the intrigue he wrote this article I want to read one sentence that absolutely blew me out of my living room chair he said as they describe these native people as they describe their recollections it occurred to me how incredibly unlikely it was that the Palm Beach, that was the little area in the river where they all got speared, that the Palm Beach killing took place at all. It is an anomaly that I cannot explain outside divine intervention. I can only explain the spearing of my dad by virtue of divine intervention. Do you hear what this son is saying? 
God killed my dad. He believes that. He might be in this room for all I know. And I believe that. God killed Jesus. And according to Revelation 6, 11, when you have a glimpse of the throne room and the martyrs who had shed their blood for the gospel are seen, how long, O oh Lord, how long till you vindicate our blood? The answer comes back. Now, I don't want you to think I said this. I'll read it to you. Because when I say things like that, people tend to say, that's not true. God didn't kill Nate Sane. I think that's what divine intervention means. I cannot explain the death of my dad except by divine intervention to help bring it about. It wasn't going to happen. It couldn't happen apart from God's intervention. Now, what John said in Revelation is, then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Rest until the number that I have appointed is complete. God's got a number of martyrs. When it's complete, the end will come. And some are in this room right now. I believe that with all my heart. It's no, it takes no imagination, it takes no guesswork. Look at the number and look at the world. Let's move from the promise is sure to the price is suffering. Point number two. The price is suffering and the volatility in the world today against the church is not decreasing, it's increasing, especially among the groups that need the gospel. There is no such thing as a closed country. It's a foreign notion, has no root or warrant in the Bible. It would have been unintelligible to the Apostle Paul, who laid his life down in every city that he went to. Therefore, there are martyrs in this room. Statistically, it's easy to predict. Last Sunday, or two, what it was, two Sundays ago, three, was a focus on the suffering church, and many of you were involved in it. This World Missions Fellowship was involved in it, and you all saw videos or heard stories about places like Sudan, where the Muslim regime is systematically ostracizing, positioning, and starving Christians, so that about 500 martyrs a day are happening in Sudan. Today, China, who knows, Indonesia, I get emails, big conflagration in eastern Indonesia in the last couple of weeks with many churches being burned and people being killed. And I get very tired of people coming to look at staff positions in my church, which is downtown Minneapolis, and we all live in the inner city, which is no big deal because there's no inner city in Minneapolis. Don't, don't think Cabrini Green when you think inner city. And one of the first questions they ask is, will my children be safe? And I want to say, would you ask that question 10th and not first? I'm just tired of hearing that. I'm tired of American priorities. Whoever said that your children would be safe in the call of God? YWAM is a wild-eyed radical group that I love. I got an email on September 1st, 150 men armed with machetes, this is India, surrounded the premises occupied by YWAM team in India. The mob had been incited by other religious groups in an effort to chase them off. As the mob pressed in, someone in a key moment spoke up on the team's behalf and they decided to give them 30 days to leave. The team feels they should not leave and that their ministry work in the city is at stake. Much fruit has been seen in a previously unreached region and there is great potential for more. In the past, when violence has broken out between rival religious groups, people have lost their lives. Please pray for them to have wisdom. Now, this is exactly the opposite of what I hear mainly in America. 
as people decide where to live, for example. Not if there are 150 people with machetes surrounding my house, I don't want to leave because this is where I'm called and this is where there's need. W would you please join me in reversing American evangelical priorities so that you don't ask those questions, so that you don't assume. It seems to be woven into the very fabric of our consumer culture that we move toward comfort, toward security, toward ease, toward safety, away from stress, away from trouble, away from danger, and it ought to be exactly the opposite. He who would come after me, let him take up his cross and die. Now, somebody asked me why I was coming down here. I said, I'm coming to do Bonhoeffer on them. <laughs> he who would come after Jesus must come and die. So I just don't get it. I just don't get it. It's the absorption of a consumer comfort ease culture that permeates the church and creates little ministries and churches in which safe, secure, nice things are done for each other and little safe excursions out to help save some others. But oh, we won't live there and oh, we won't stay there. Not even in America, not to mention Saudi Arabia. I was in Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago talking to another wild-eyed, wonderful missions group, Frontiers, led by Greg Livingstone. What a great group. 500 people sitting in front of me risk their lives every day among Muslim peoples. And to listen to them and to know that right there they're getting emails. And they stand up and they read the emails. Email number one, please pray for X. He was stabbed in the chest three times yesterday, and the worst thing is his children were watching him. He's in the hospital. He's in critical condition. This is a missionary in a Muslim world, in a Muslim area. Let's pray for him and go to prayer. <clears throat> Next day, email comes. This time, six Christian brothers in Morocco have been arrested. Let's pray for him. Right on through the conference. And here they are. And they're there and ready to go back. They've come for encouragement. They've come to be stirred. You think I'm going to come back to America and be the same? You think I'm going to stand up in front of my church and say, oh, let's, let's just have nice, comfortable, easy services. Let's just be comfortable and secure. Golgotha is not a suburb of Jerusalem. Let us go with him outside the gate and suffer with him and bear reproach Hebrews 13, 13. But I haven't said the main thing about the price yet of getting the job done, that there will be martyrs, there must be suffering, because suffering is the means, and not just the price, it's the means. Now here's what I have in my mind. I'm going to read a verse for you that's very important. This is Colossians 1, 24. A few years ago, maybe two or three, I can't remember, it just came crashing in on me with its meaning. I'll show you how I got it. Now I rejoice, Paul says, in my sufferings. He was a very strange person. <laughs> I rejoice in my sufferings. Very countercultural, very un-American, very counter-human. <laughs> very strange person. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, this, in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, the, the ingathering of God's elect, in filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Now that's on the brink of blasphemy. What does he mean by filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ? He does not mean, I think we would all agree, 
he improves upon the merit and the atoning worth of Jesus' blood. That's not what he means. Well, what does he mean? That he completes what is lacking in the afflictions of Jesus. And you know where I found the answer? I typed into my little computer Bible program this Greek word for fill up or complete, and I typed in the word hustereo or whatever the noun form of that is for lacking, and asked, show me, Mr. Computer, where both of these occur anywhere else in the Greek Bible. And there's only one other place. I'll read it to you. It's in Philippians, and it's in chapter 2, verse 30. The situation is that Epaphroditus, remember him, was sent by the Philippian church over to uh, Paul in Rome, and he risks his life to get there, and Paul extols him as risking his life and tells the Philippians they should receive such a one with honor because he was sick unto death and risked his neck to complete their ministry to him. And here's the key parallel verse. Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. The only other place where these two words come into conjunction. To complete what is lacking in your service to me. And I opened up my 100-year-old Vincent's commentary on Philippians and read an explanation of that verse, which I think is a perfect interpretation of Colossians 1.24. And I'll read you Vincent's words. He said... The gift of Paul, the gift to Paul from the Philippians, was a gift of the church as a body. It was a sacrificial offering of love. What was lacking was the church's presentation of this offering in person. This was impossible. And Paul represents Epaphroditus as supplying this lack by his affectionate, zealous ministry. So the picture is, here's a church that wants to get love in the form of law, uh, money over to Rome. And they can't do it. There's too many of them. It's too long. It's too far. And so they say, Epaphroditus, represent us and complete what is lacking in our love. And there's nothing lacking in our love except the expression of our love in person. There, take it, communicate it to Paul. Now that's exactly what I think Colossians 1.24 means. Jesus dies and he suffers for people all over the world in every nation. He suffers. And then he, he's buried. And according to the scriptures, he's raised on the third day. And he ascends into heaven and he reigns over the world. And he leaves a work to be done. And Paul's self-understanding of his mission is that there's one thing lacking in the sufferings of Jesus. The love offering is to be presented in person in the body of Christ through missionaries to the peoples for whom he died. And he says, I do this in my sufferings. In my sufferings, I complete what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Which means that Christ intends for the Great Commission to be a presentation to the nations of the sufferings of His cross in the sufferings of His people. That's the way the commission will be finished, folks. And if you sign up tonight with your heart, that's what you sign up for. That's the way it'll get done. About, uh, when was it, three years ago I was working on that green book on missions and I hid away over at Trinity Seminary in Deerfield. I hid. Don't know I'm there. Don't anybody bother me. My wife and kids are at home. I'm working 18 hours a day. Stay away from me. And I get word, J. Aldwell Sanders is in chapel. 89 years old, veteran, 
great missions leader. I said, ooh, shall I go public? <laughs> and show up over there and have to talk to a lot of people and get dinner engagements and all this stuff and not get anything done. But I want to hear him. So I sneak into the back of the chapel and listen to him. And here's this 89-year-old man. He's dead now. He's with Jesus. And he stood up there, 89 years old. I'm just oozing with admiration and desire to be like this when I'm 89. And he, he tells the story that so embodies Colossians 1.24. I wanted to share it with you in a nutshell. I can't remember all the details, but here's the gist of it. He said there was in India an evangelist who tromped across the roads to various villages preaching the gospel. Simple man, no education, loved Jesus with all his heart, ready to lay his life down. And he came to a village without the gospel. It was late in the day. He was very tired. He comes into the village. He lifts up his voice. He shares the gospel with those gathered in the square. And they mock him, deride him, and drive him out of town. And he's so tired. There aren't any emotional resources left. He lies down under a tree, utterly discouraged, goes sound asleep, doesn't know if he'll ever wake up because they might come kill him for all he knows. And suddenly, just after dusk, he's startled and he wakes up and the whole town, it seems like, is around him and they're looking at him. And he thinks he's a goner. And he's trembling there. And one of the big men in the village says, we came out to see what kind of man you were and when we saw your blistered feet we knew you were a holy man and we want you to tell us why you got blistered feet to come talk to us and he preached the gospel and according to J. Oswald Sanders the whole village believed that's what Paul means by I complete in my sufferings what is lacking in the afflictions of Jesus now, I have one other little parenthesis here about J. Oswald Sanders, and I can't resist this because I know there's more people here than just 20-year-olds. He's 89 years old. And he said, I, I got caught at the end of the service and got invited to lunch with J. Oswald Sanders. <laughs> God works all things together for good. <laughs> and I, I sat across from this man, and he said, I've written a book a year since I was 70. <laughs> 18 books after 70. And I have people in my church and they're all over America quitting on life at 65 and dying on the golf course in Nevada. When they ought to be laying their lives down among the Muslims like Raymond Lull. Remember that story? Raymond Lull, 12th century, Oriental scholar, Muslim missionary, retires, comes back to Italy, does his Oriental language thing for a while, quits that, begins to feel like, what am I doing? I'm going to die here in Italy. Why not die in Algeria, across the Mediterranean? And so knowing that's what it would cost him to preach publicly, he gets on a boat, I forget his age, it was 80-something too. Crosses the Mediterranean, stays underground for a little while, encouraging the church. Then he decides, this is as good a time as any. It's better than dying in a nursing home. And he stands up, and he preaches, and they kill him. What a way to go! <laughs> what? I, I mean, I really mean this. I really mean this. Listen, you 60-year-old folks, 50, I'm 50, I'm almost there. I'm getting letters from the AARP. None of you guys know what that is. <laughs> Association of Retired Persons or something like that. I'm 50 and they're trying to get me on their lists so I can have a discount on the train. or They, they have planes now, I forgot. I'm so old. I'm almost there, so I'm talking almost to myself. And my church have heard me say this. They're going to hold me to the fire on this one. That when you're old, you not only don't have anything to lose in martyrdom, you get discount fares. <laughs> and I really mean it. I really mean it. Why? 
should we think that putting in our 40 or 50 years in the bank or in the insurance company or in the church should mean we play for the last 15 years before we meet the king? I don't get it. It's American lies. It's all it is. We're strong at 65. We're strong at 70. My dad, oh, bless my dad's heart, 77. I can remember when my mom was killed and he was almost killed in a bus accident in Israel and I picked him up 10 days later with her body and him in the ambulance and all the way home from Atlanta to Greenville he lay there with his back laid wide open because they couldn't stitch the wounds they were so bad saying God must have a purpose for me God must have a purpose for me God must have a purpose for me and here we are 22 years later, and his life has exploded with ministry. He's working harder today at 77 for the nations than ever before. He's got these little lessons that he does in Easley, Georgia, and little tapes that he makes, and they're in 60 nations with about 10,000 people believing on Jesus every year because God spared my dad and caused him not to believe in retirement. Now, I don't think you have to stay in the same job after 65. I've got to stop this. You're young people. This is another sermon. And I'm, I'm supposed to be done here. The, the price is suffering. And I don't just mean price, but I mean means. Now, last point. How do you love like that? We're going to get this. You feeling ready for this? Are you, are, do you think you have it within you to be able to endure this. This is Stephen Neal's History of Missions. Get it. Read it. And on page 161, he describes what happened in Japan when the gospel came there in the 1500s and then the emperor began to realize this incursion of the Christian faith into our religious sphere is so threatening we must end it. And they ended it with absolute incredible brutality. It was over for the church in Japan. And I don't doubt that the hardness and difficulty of Japan today is largely owing to the massive triumph of the devil short term in Japan in the early 1600s like this. 27 Jesuits, 15 friars, 5 secular clergy did manage to evade the order of banishment. It was not until April 1617 that the first martyrdoms of Europeans took place. A Jesuit a Franciscan being beheaded at Omura at that time, and a Dominican and an Augustinian a little later in the same area. Every kind of cruelty was practiced on the pitiable victims of the persecution. Crucifixion was the method usually employed in the case of Japanese Christians. On one occasion, 70 Japanese at Yedo were crucified upside down at low water and were drowned as the tide came in. I cried three days ago when I read that because I got a, a good enough imagination to picture the lapping water with your wife on one side and your 16 year old on another are you ready you think you've got that within you you don't no way does anybody in this room have that resourcefulness within you where are you gonna get it and that's what I want to close with you're gonna get it by believing promises Believing the promises of God. And I'll cut this real short here and take you straight to my favorite text. If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Favorite text about where you get the resources to live like this. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 32 to 34. Recall the former days when after you were enlightened you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to abuse and affliction and sometimes being partners with those so treated. And let me stop there and give you the situation as I read it. In the early days of the church, persecution arose. Some of them suffered outright and publicly and others then had compassion on them in some way and you'll, you'll see in the next verse that it's some of them were in prison and some of them went to visit them so they were forced into a decision those who are in prison in those days depended probably for others on food and water and 
any kind of physical care that they would need, but that means that their friends and neighbors have got to go public with identification, and that's risky business when somebody's been put in jail because they're a Christian. So here's the free church, goes underground for a few hours and says, what are we going to do? We're going to go to Saudi Arabia or not? And somebody said, Psalm 63.3 says, the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. Better than life. Let's go. And if Martin Luther had been there, he would have said, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Let's go. And that's exactly what they did. Let's read the rest of it. Verse 34. You had compassion, compassion on the prisoners and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Now here's what happened. This doesn't take any imagination. I don't know the precise things, but here's what happened. They had compassion on the prisoners, which means they went to them and their property, house, chariot, horses, mules, Carpentry stools, chairs, whatever, was set on fire by mob. Or maybe just ransacked and thrown into the street with people with big knives. And when they looked over their shoulder to see what was happening back there, you tell me what they did. What did they do? What did the text say they did? Say it loud. They rejoiced. Now, if you're not like that, somebody bashes your computer in when you're trying to minister to them and be nice, or you drive downtown to minister and they smash your windshield, get your radio, or slash your tires, or if you're not like this, then you're not going to be a very good candidate for martyrdom either. So the question is, how do you get to be like this? I want to be like this. That's why I love this text. I want to be like this. I make no claim to being a, ber a perfect embodiment of this, but I want to be like this. So that when a rock comes sailing through my kitchen window like it's done twice in the last couple of months, smashes the glass and my wife and children hit the floor, not knowing if it's a bullet or a grenade, I want to say, this is a great neighborhood to live in. This is where the needs are. You see those five teenage kids that just rode by? They need Jesus. If I move out of here, who's going to tell them about Jesus? If the pastor, everybody knows the pastor lives on this corner. Been there 16, I've been there 13 years. If the pastor runs, what you got to say? This is a great place to be. When your little boy gets pushed off his bicycle and they take it and run, you say, Barnabas, you grab him by the neck while he's crying, you say, Barnabas. It's like missionary. It's like getting ready for the mission field. This is great. <laughs> and they believe that. I gave a message on Colossians 124 in Pensacola, Florida two years ago. Had my 16-year-old with me, Abraham, who I hope will be a student here in two years. Pray for him. <laughs> um, he's sitting out there, right about where you are over there. And I'm saying what I'm saying here, this kind of stuff heavy duty suffering call to this and uh, we got in the car to go home and my wife said to Abraham well what you think God is doing in there he said um, I'm gonna buy a one-way ticket to the hardest country in the world that's all he said I bumped my head on the ceiling <laughs> This is great. Thank you, Lord, for Abraham and what you're doing in his life. Now, I haven't gotten to the main point of the text yet. <laughs> Why did they have the wherewithal to rejoice at the plundering of their property and the risking of their lives? Now we get, now we get it. Here it comes. Since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. This is what I call faith in future grace. I'm, I'm done. This is my, I'm just going to close now with, with just a few thoughts. 
there's almost all Christians in this room. And that means that God is holding out to you absolutely, indescribably wonderful promises. I will never leave you or forsake you. Therefore, you can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Well, the answer is he can kill you. But that is no stopping because you know what Romans 8 says. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered all day long. Yet, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, nothing ultimate can harm me. You remember what Jesus said in Luke 21? He said, some of you they will kill and some of you they will throw into prison, yet not a hair of your head will perish. They'll move your long hair when they use the sword. <laughs> or something like that. I mean, can you, put, can you give me a better interpretation? Some of you they will kill, but not a hair of your head will perish. Some of you they will kill, but not a hair of your head will perish. You interpret it. Some of you they will kill, but not a hair of your head will perish. It's just Romans 8. Everything, including death, works together for your good. When you die, you don't perish. You, to die is gain. Doing missions when death is gain 